What we're going to look at today is Java Server Faces. All I'm going to do is to introduce you to some of the basic concepts of JSF. That will include the page structures and things like that. There will be lots of the user interface components that I will not touch on today, and I'll introduce more of those in uh, forthcoming lectures. What we'll also take a look at is the JSF lifecycle and also see how to write a JSF application. But before we do that, I wanted just to give a very quick potted history of how we got from the web when it started to where we are today with Java Server Faces. The problem with the web, as you already know from right at the beginning of this module, is that if all you do is use HTML pages, you've got static content. That quickly became undesirable. And so around about the middle of the 1990s, the Common Gateway Interface was introduced and that provided a way for generating on the fly the content that was to be displayed in the web browser. Now that's all well and good, except that as the HTML page invoked the server-side process, what it was actually invoking was one of something like an, an operating system shell script or some kind of natively compiled program or an interpreted language such as Perl. And part of the problem with that was that we couldn't scale this to high performance because those resources were pretty intensive in terms of uh, processor consumption. That problem was alleviated somewhat by the use of multi-threaded APIs, but whatever the web server had installed as an API, that's what the scripts had to conform to and, more importantly, what the HTML page had to conform to. So we had a few problems there. Then in uh, March of 1998, Java, which had been around for a few years by then, was now then introduced as a valid server-side technology. So the servlet API was introduced. So what we've been using thus far on this module dates from 1998 and has stood the test of time and has been uh, a very good way of writing dynamic web applications. However, we haven't really got rid of the problem of proprietary API but it did at least mean that it was object-oriented. And around about the late 90s, OO had, had really got a strong foothold as the standard paradigm across the industry. One of the things that it had going for it was the concept of write once, run anywhere. So you could write your application for your test web server, and as long as any other web server had got the servlet container installed, then you could run it on any other web server too. And there wouldn't need to be any changes made to the, uh, the web pages. But as you have already discovered on the first six weeks of this module, writing HTML to be generated by a servlet is really tedious and time consuming. Out.println and then inside the string you've got your HTML tag with probably embedded double quotes and the like, and it's really painful to have to write it, and it's really painful to have to try and debug it if you get it wrong. This was remedied by the introduction the year later of Java Server Pages. And as you've experienced on this module, using a Java Server page for your view has been much easier than using servlets as the view component, because you could write the HTML in its standard format instead of having to bury it inside a method call. And so it almost entirely eliminated the awkwardness of using servlets. Didn't really get past the, the idea of using a servlet because the Java server page is converted into a servlet and that can make debugging rather difficult, as you've discovered. But we have some problems still that are residual. The Java code being mixed with Java server page action tags means that the code on the screen becomes really cluttered and sometimes very difficult to follow because you have, if you want to have an if statement or a while loop or something, you have a scriptlet that starts with the angle bracket percent and ends with an angle bracket percent and if you want to put some HTML inside the body of that control structure, you've then got to terminate the scriptlet after the opening brace, embed your HTML and then open another scriptlet for your closing brace. And that really gets the page terribly cluttered. The harder you make something to read, the more error prone it is to write, 
and more difficult to debug. But of course, the real problem is that MVC is not enforced. We've been using MVC, but it hasn't been enforced on us. We've elected to use MVC, and the way that I've shown you to use MVC for this module is not the way of doing it. It is one of the ways in which MVC can be written. And because it's so flexible in this way, it means that we have no enforcement of clean separation of components in the MVC architecture. And what we see in here sometimes is that model code can very easily be buried inside the view component. So we might decide, oh, let's interact with the database from the, the Java server page. Shouldn't be doing that, not if you're using clean MVC. But this framework didn't prevent it. In 2000, Apache Struts was introduced. This was also a JSP-based architecture, but it had a clean MVC that was enforced. And one of the things that is notable about this is that the model became action classes. These were, rather than being servlets, they were POJOs, plain old Java objects, that were implementing a particular interface. And therefore, because of this separation of concerns now between the MVC components, this gave us a much sounder, much more appropriate architecture. But then we still got the problem with that user interface of having to write a lot of low-level HTML code. In 2003, the Spring Framework introduced a few other things. It had its own MVC version, its own framework. But what it did was to give us a very clear separation of business logic from application logic. In other words, the view and the model were very distinct. It also introduced the concept of inversion of control, which meant then that the container was going to control the configuration and life cycle of Java objects. And we'll see that in Java server faces a bit later. And that the configuration was defined using either XML files, and we've seen that to some extent with the web.xml file in the servlet, where we would define a servlet in WebXML, or using Java annotations. And again, we've seen that in, in some of the things that we've been doing, because we can nominate a servlet by using an annotation instead of using the XML file. The other thing that was preserved in Spring that came through from Struts was the idea of using POJOs, plain old Java objects, for business logic. And that gives us a much more flexible way of writing our code. So we have this informal contract programming going on. We don't have to make it a servlet, which has got a, a, a very well-defined contract in terms of its interface. And that meant then that we've got less constraint being imposed by the framework and the APIs. So when, in the following year, the Java Server Faces framework was introduced, what it did was, in many ways, bring together all those positive points from its predecessors. Now, the latest release of JSF was version 2.2, and that was released in 2013. And that's what we'll be using on this module. Again, it enforces very clean MVC. It also has inversion of control, in which the container maintains the life cycle of its Java objects. And again, we can use either an XML file or annotations to do the configuration of things. And as we will see as time goes on, we'll actually make use of both concepts. The business logic will be in POJOs using beans. Now, there's a concept you've heard of in the last few weeks. And the component-based user interface is really what sets JSF apart from all of those previous dynamic web content generators. What it means is that instead of writing low-level HTML, we're going to write abstract representations of user interface components, which means we can, if we choose carefully, avoid the use of HTML, low-level HTML. And what we'll put in instead are these abstractions. Those abstractions will then be converted to the appropriate representation depending upon things like what browser am I using? What version of browser am I using? Indeed, what client am I using? Is it a desktop machine? Is it a smartphone? Is it a tablet? The same view will be represented in different ways according to the client that's made the request. Previously, we would have had to write the 
low-level HTML to distinguish between each of the client types. But now, making use of the abstract representation of UI components, such as a text box, or a form, or a button, or something, they will be automatically converted to the appropriate representation for that client. Now, when they were designing Java server faces, they had quite a few goals, the principal ones of which are listed here. So they wanted, first and foremost, a standard user interface component framework. That standard framework would be underpinned by simple, lightweight Java classes. Now, lightweight means 100% Java. No call to any native code. From those lightweight Java classes, we could have a set then of common user interface components. Those components would be used to generate views, and sitting behind those views would be Java beans that would be used to store data, to provide information that could then be rendered in those views. We're going to have also a, an event model, and we'll look at some of that as time goes on. There's going to be some APIs for validating the form data. We'll look at the validation aspects in the next lecture. And as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be output that is automatically suited to the target client.